Hello everyone, in today's lecture video we are going to pick up where we left off at the end of the lecture on Thursday, working through the following example problem. I have written this problem in a more concise manner, put it all on one screen, so if you need to pause the video, copy all this down before I move on, please do so. In the following example problem, we are heating kerosene. The kerosene has an average temperature of 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and it is moving through the piping at a linear, excuse me, at a linear velocity of 8 feet per second. We are told that the tubing or piping material is 3 fourths inch outside diameter BWG 16 piping. So based on this, we know that the outside diameter is 0.75 inches. We can go to the back of the textbook. From the back of the textbook, we can get the thickness of the pipe as well as the inside diameter of the pipe. We are also told that the convective heat transfer coefficient on the outside of the pipe is 300 BTUs per hour foot squared degrees Fahrenheit. Since our kerosene is at an average temperature of 110 degrees Fahrenheit, that is the bulk temperature of our fluid. And therefore, we can look up the following properties of the fluid at 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I had to let my dog back inside. Okay. And what's the goal of this problem? Our goal here is to calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient based on the outside area of the pipe. Okay, so the first place to start, let's start with our equation to calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. Remembering that our overall heat transfer coefficient is 1 over the area times the sum of our thermal resistances. I am going to take the equation from your notes that has this in terms of the diameter of the pipe. And so I have my convective resistance on the inside of the pipe, 1 over HI multiplied by the ratio of the outside and inside diameter. Next, I have my conductive resistance, so the thickness of my pipe wall, the thermal conductivity of the piping material, and that's multiplied by the ratio of the outside diameter to the log mean diameter. And finally, we have our thermal resistance due to convective heat transfer at the outside of our pipe. All right, so in this equation, what do we know? Well, we know inside and outside diameter. We know the thickness of our wall. We are given the convective heat transfer coefficient on the outside of the pipe. We don't have yet, but can look up the thermal conductivity of the piping material. And so what do we have left to calculate? Well, we need to calculate the convective heat transfer coefficient on the inside of the pipe. That's going to take a little bit more work. So the first thing we can do is calculate the log mean diameter of our pipe. We remember that the log mean diameter formula tells us that the log mean diameter is equal to the difference in diameters divided by the natural log of the ratio of those diameters. In this case, we have an outside diameter of 0.75 inches. I convert that to feet. Inside diameter of 0.62 inches, also converted to feet. And then the natural log of that ratio. If I've done my math correctly, I get a log mean diameter 
equal to 0 0.0569 feet. All right, now we can circle this. We found it. Last thing we are left with is to calculate the convective heat transfer coefficient on the inside of our pipe. To, excuse me, to properly calculate that, the first thing we need to do is determine what the flow regime is for the kerosene. Again, depending on whether we are in laminar, turbulent, or in that transition region, there are different correlations that correlate the Reynolds number and Prandtl number to the Nusselt number, which buried inside of it is the convective heat transfer coefficient. That means the first thing that we need to do, or the next thing we need to do, is calculate the Reynolds number of the kerosene. What do we need? So our Reynolds number, based on the bulk properties, We are given, or we looked up, given the bulk viscosity, bulk thermal conductivity, and this is the specific gravity. Our density here is therefore going to be equal to 0 0.805. Reference density here for water is 64. Point, or excuse me, 62.42 pound mass per foot cubed. We're given a linear velocity of 8 feet per second. The diameter of our pipe in feet, in this case we are asking for the inside diameter of the pipe. 0, 0.0517 feet, and then all of that divided by the viscosity. Our viscosity is given to us 1.50 centipoise. I can convert that to pound mass foot hour. Which is what I've done, which means that I also need a conversion from seconds to hours up here. Let's go ahead and put that in. We know that one hour has 3,600 seconds. That gives us our linear velocity in feet per hour, which matches with the viscosity value that I have, which is in pound mass per foot hour. Okay. Performing that calculation, I get a Reynolds number that is a little above 20,000. That means that I am well within the turbulent regime, and I can use the Cedar-Tate equation to calculate the convective heat transfer coefficient on the inside of my pipe. I know that the Cedar-Tate equation is valid for Reynolds numbers greater than 6,000, 21,000 is definitely greater than 6,000. My Cedar-Tate equation takes the following form. So the Nusselt number is equal to the convective heat transfer coefficient on the inside of the pipe multiplied by the inside diameter of the pipe, and that is divided by the thermal conductivity of the kerosene at the bulk temperature of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That is all equal to 0 0.023 Reynolds number raised to the 0.8 Prandtl number raised to the one third, and then our viscosity correction factor. For simplicity, we are going to assume that this viscosity correction factor is 1. That means that the next thing we have left to do 
is to plug in our values here for the Pranolt number. We already know the Reynolds number, and then we can move that ratio of diameter to thermal conductivity to the right-hand side of our equation. Okay, so what did I just say? I said that the convective heat transfer coefficient on the inside of the pipe is equal to 0 0.023 multiplied by the ratio thermal conductivity of the kerosene at the bulk temperature divided by the inside diameter of the pipe multiplied by the Reynolds number to the 0.8 power and then our Pranolt number which is specific heat, viscosity, and thermal conductivity. That's all at our bulk temperature raised to the one-third power. All right, let's start plugging some numbers in. Okay, thermal conductivity. What did we say that was? 0 0.0875. So 0 0.0875 thermal conductivity units, BTUs per hour, foot degrees Fahrenheit, inside diameter in terms of feet, 0 0.0517. Next, my Reynolds number, which I just calculated, 20,612.8 power. And then now I have my Pranolt number parameters, so my specific heat, 0.583 BTUs per pound mass degrees Fahrenheit. That is multiplied by the viscosity at the bulk temperature, which we just saw was 3.63 pound mass per foot hour. Divided by the same thermal conductivity, so point. 0.875 BTUs per hour foot degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, all of that is raised to the one third power. Let me zoom out and get all of that on one screen. That is our equation, our Cedar Tate equation, completely filled in with our parameters. Performing that calculation, we get a convective heat transfer coefficient on the inside of the pipe of 318 BTUs per hour foot squared degrees Fahrenheit. Great, now that we have calculated that, we have no more unknowns in our equation for the overall heat transfer coefficient. So I can plug values into that equation. I have one over, I'm going to leave my units out for simplicity, 318, my diameters, both of these are in feet, outside diameter, inside diameter, then thickness of my wall, this has also been converted to feet. Thermal conductivity of my wall material is 26 BTUs per hour foot degrees Fahrenheit. And this value I got from Appendix 10. By default, the BWG piping, the numbers shown, I'm going to point this out. In the back of your textbook, these are all for steel. The numbers themselves and size don't change. The only thing that changes here is the weight. If I go from steel to copper, 
I need to take that column and multiply that weight by 1.4. If I go from steel to brass, I need to multiply that weight by 1.06. But other than that, all the numbers are the same. But again, by default, if it just says BWG piping, you have to assume that they're talking about steel piping. So I get the thermal conductivity of the steel from Appendix 10. Then I have the outside diameter, the log mean diameter. Both of those in feet. And then finally, my convective heat transfer coefficient on the outside of my pipe. All right, my H's and K's are in imperial or English units. My diameters are all in feet. So everything in thickness is in feet. Everything should cancel out. And what I should be left with is an overall heat transfer coefficient. Well, I'll write the raw calculation. So 1.35.8. I'll write the units here in a second. Three sig figs is what I'm going to report to. So 1.36 BTUs, and the overall heat transfer coefficient, just so you know, has the same units as the individual heat transfer coefficient. So BTUs per hour foot squared degrees Fahrenheit. And so that is the overall heat transfer coefficient for our particular heat exchanger based on the outside area of the tube. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is continue on to lecture notes 24. And for lecture notes 24, we are going to discuss natural or free convection. So up to this point, all of the problems or discussions we have had have been for forced convection, i.e. there is some external force that is acting on the fluid that is causing it to move, compressor, pump, fan, right? Even, excuse me, one of those three, those are good examples. Something is acting on the fluid causing it to move, and so it is quote unquote forced convection. In this scenario, we are talking about natural or free convection, and so the best way to do that is to imagine the following scenario. In the following scenario, we have a wall. That wall is being held at a constant temperature. In this case, I've called that temperature Tw. That wall is brought into contact with air in a room. The temperature of the air far away from the plate is T infinity. So the air out here is equal to T and whoops, equal to T infinity. This is probably going to be too thick anyways. And our wall T T W. Okay, and what the text says is, as the density of the heated air near the plate is less than that of the unheated air further away from the plate, the air will begin to circulate, caused by the unbalanced forces between the vertical layers of air of differing density. All, right, all of that is to say, hot air rises, cooler air flows downward. Right? So what happens here is we end up getting circulation of air because the air closer to the hot plate or the hot wall gets heated, its density is lowered, and so there is a change in the buoyancy of that hot air compared to the cooler air that is further away that falls and you get this eddy that forms where air is rising and falling. We can draw what the temperature profile and velocity profile of that air look like near this hot plate. 
And so let me do that. I'm just going to draw some arbitrary boundary layer. So here's our boundary layer. And then we can draw a temperature profile as well as a velocity profile. So the velocity profile is going to look something like this. Maybe a little bit more pronounced than that. And so, of course, closer to the wall, the air has a higher velocity. Directly adjacent to the wall, the air has a velocity of zero because the plate or wall isn't moving. And then eventually, as you move further and further out, we get back to where we essentially have a stationary fluid. Our temperature profile will look something like this. where the temperature will go from the temperature of the wall or the surface, Tw, out to T infinity. Okay, when we have convective heat transfer at a fluid solid boundary, and that heat transfer is due to natural convection, we can calculate that using the following equation. Here we have the Nusselt number. The Nusselt number is equal to H. Here I'm going to use the characteristic length L. And you'll see this subscript F, we'll talk about that in a second. L, that is the length of my vertical plate. All right, that is equal to B times the characteristic length scale here, L cubed, the density of our fluid squared, gravity, the thermal expansion coefficient or volumetric expansion coefficient. A delta T, we'll talk about that in a second as well. Oh, I can't draw a straight line. And that is divided by the viscosity of the fluid squared. That is all multiplied by the Pranolt number. And this entire thing is raised to the power n. In the following equation, b and n are constants. They're essentially, essentially geometric factors. L is the height or length of the vertical or horizontal plate. So keeping in mind here, this... Somewhere right here, we're talking about natural convection near a plate, whether that plate is vertical or horizontal. We'll talk about natural convection uh, over a pipe uh, shortly. So just make sure you have that written down somewhere so you know that we are talking about natural convection near a flat plate or surface. The delta T in the equation above represents the surface temperature, so for us that's T wall, minus the bulk temperature of the fluid or the temperature of the fluid far away from the wall. And then like I said, the uh, capital beta is the coefficient of volumetric expansion or coefficient of thermal expansion. As you see in the equation, all of the parameters have the subscript F, 
This is to indicate that these fluid properties are calculated at the mean film temperature. What is the mean film temperature? Well, the mean film temperature is equal to the temperature at the surface or the wall plus the bulk temperature of the fluid or the temperature far away from the wall right, divided by two. So simply the arithmetic average of the surface temperature and the bulk temperature of the fluid. Table 12.14. It gives us values for B and N for various geometric configurations. So if we have vertical plates, we have one set of parameters, and you should also note here, and we'll talk about this on the next page, what this GR term here is, but that's this dimensionless group here. So GR times PR, it has to be within a particular range, and then I apply one set or the other of parameters. You have to think a little bit more when you're dealing with horizontal plates. Is the heated face upward or downward? Cooled face upward or downward? Right? That depends on which one of these geometric factors you are using to calculate the convective heat transfer coefficient due to natural convection. All right, so I mentioned we would discuss the dimensionless number. So it's while not excuse me, whoa, while not necessarily obvious, that group of variables that I put in the orange parentheses is a dimensionless group of variables. That dimensionless group of variables is referred to as the Grasshoff number. And the Grasshoff number is the characteristic length scale. So here it is L cubed multiplied by the density squared gravity coefficient of volumetric expansion, or delta T, which again is the surface temperature minus the bulk fluid temperature, and all of that is divided by the viscosity of the fluid squared. The Grassoff number is a ratio of buoyancy and viscous forces, which makes sense, right? Buoyancy is what, or changes in buoyancy are what, is what, excuse me, what am I trying to say here? Changes in the buoyant forces is what is causing the fluid to actually convect and circulate near that hot plate. So it makes sense that the dimensionless number associated with that would be some ratio of forces where one of those forces is the buoyancy force. The other parameter that pops up in that dimensionless group that we may not be as familiar with is the coefficient of thermal or volumetric expansion beta. That is a property of the fluid and is defined as the fractional increase in volume at a constant pressure of the fluid per degree change in temperature. So what did I just say? I said that I'm going to write the bottom term first so I make sure that lines up. Change in volume per change in temperature, constant pressure. Here, the capital V sub S with the bar over it is the specific volume of the fluid. And that specific volume is going to have units of inverse density. So here we're talking about dimensions of volume per mass. We can define that thermal expansion coefficient for both a liquid and a gas. So for a liquid, the coefficient of thermal expansion equals the difference in densities divided by the average density multiplied by the difference in temperatures. And so in terms of variables that we used above, 
we are saying the density of the fluid at the bulk temperature minus the density of the fluid at the surface temperature divided by the average density, so density in the bulk plus density at the surface divided by 2, and that is multiplied by the temperature at the surface minus the temperature far away from the surface. Okay, so that's how we would calculate the thermal expansion coefficient for a liquid. For a gas, we are going to assume that we have an ideal gas. And so for an ideal gas, the excuse me, for an ideal gas, the specific volume of the gas is equal to RT divided by pressure. And again, that's for an ideal gas. We can take this, we can take the partial derivative of that with respect to temperature, holding pressure constant. So partial derivative with respect to temperature, holding pressure constant will leave us with the gas constant divided by the pressure. Therefore, beta will equal the gas constant divided by the pressure divided by RT divided by the pressure. R's cancel out, pressures cancel out, and we simply get 1 over T. And so down here... We know that the thermal expansion or coefficient of thermal expansion for an ideal gas is simply equal to 1 over the temperature. Keeping in mind that that temperature value needs to be an absolute temperature. So what do I mean by an absolute temperature? It either needs to be in Kelvin or degrees ranking. Those are the two options. You cannot use degrees Celsius and you cannot use degrees Fahrenheit. We either need Kelvin or degrees Rankin. Okay, I'm going to simply recast whoops, equation one in terms of dimensionless numbers. I've already included the Pranolt number. So let's write that in terms of the Pranolt number and Grasshoff number, so we end up with the Nusselt number is equal to H times L divided by K. That is equal to the constant B, Grasshoff number at the film temperature, Pranolt number at the film temperature, and all of that raised to the power N. So again, this is the equation I would use for convective heat transfer when that convective heat transfer is natural convection and that natural convection is, is occurring next to a flat vertical or horizontal surface. I've added a note here that actually this, excuse me, the product of the Grasshoff number and the Pranolt number is referred to as the Raleigh number. And as you might imagine, that Raleigh number is associated with buoyancy-driven flow. Just wanted to point that out because sometimes you'll see this equation simply written as B times the Raleigh number raised to the power of N. All right, so again, everything we've talked about up to this point Really what I mean by that is this equation that we've come to is associated with natural convection near a flat vertical or horizontal surface. That's not always the case. So what if we have natural convection and we have a single cylinder? So imagine we have a cylinder, that cylinder is heated to some temperature and then I am putting or placing that cylinder in a room full of air 
right, that air is going to potentially naturally convect near the cylindrical surface of that pipe. If we have natural convection for a single cylinder, we can use the following figure to help determine the Nusselt number. And so what you see in the figure is a plot of log base 10 of the Nusselt number versus log base 10 of this product of the Grasshoff and Pranolt number, which we could also write as the log base 10 of the Raleigh number. So how this would work, we would calculate log base 10, Grasshoff and Pranolt. Let's say it was three. We would then come up to this line and then move over to the left, this would give us log base 10 nusselt number. Calculate the nusselt number. And then of course our nusselt number is equal to the natural, excuse me, nusselt number is equal to the convective heat transfer coefficient. In this case, it would be based on the outside diameter of the pipe and then the thermal conductivity of the fluid surrounding the pipe which of course would be evaluated at the film temperature. In this scenario, the only thing that changes with our Grasshoff number is our characteristic length scale. So instead of the length or height of the vertical or horizontal surface, we're now talking about the outside diameter of our cylinder. So again, I want to make sure that you understand we're not talking about air existing inside the pipe. You can have natural convection in that case, but the equation and plot that you're seeing here are representative of when I'm taking a heated cylinder, let's say, placing it in a room full of air and then allowing that air to naturally convect next to that hot surface. So the characteristic length scale is based on the outside diameter. There's a note at the end that says four log base 10 product of Grasshoff and Pranolt number when that's greater than four. So up here on our plot, when we are greater than four, you can see that that is almost a perfect line. And so that line above that product of four follows closely the following empirical equation. So our Nusselt number, this would be equal to convective heat transfer coefficient outside diameter divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid at the film temperature is equal to 0.53 Grasshoff number, Pranolt number raised to the 0.25 power. So if I calculate the product of the Grasshoff and Pranolt number, I take the log base 10 of that. If that's greater than 4, I can use the following equation to actually calculate the convective heat transfer coefficient. So if I didn't have that figure, but I did have the scenario where I had that number being greater than 4, I could simply use that equation to calculate my convective heat transfer coefficient. Okay, so after all of that, I imagine maybe one of the questions that one might have is when do we consider forced convection? When do we consider natural convection? Are there criteria that help us evaluate when those scenarios occur? Do we have to account for both of those? And so what I've done here on the last page is include some criteria that will help you determine when to account for forced convection, when to account for natural convection, and when you need to account for combined forced and natural convection. And so that's done by taking a ratio of dimensionless groups. Those dimensionless groups are the Grasshoff number and the Reynolds number. So if I take the Grasshoff number, I take the Reynolds number squared, take the ratio of those two numbers. If that number is significantly greater then one, let me try to line those up a little bit better. And so in transport, we typically talk about things in terms of orders of magnitude. So when you see this, what you can put into your mind is when this parameter 
is greater than 10. So 10, 20, 100. Then I can ignore forced convection. Implications of that are that this number here is really small or this number here is really big. If the Reynolds number is really small, then the velocity of the fluid is low, and so forced convection is not going to be the primary method of heat transfer. It's going to be natural convection. And so conversely, if I take that ratio, and the number I calculate is significantly lower than 1, so again, orders of magnitude, what do I mean by significantly lower than 1? I would tell you if you calculate that number and it is less than 0.1, then we can ignore natural convection. How do I look at that? Well, I can look at that to say that my Reynolds number is really high, so the velocity of my fluid is large, or this Grassoff number, which is helping describe the ratio of buoyant and viscous forces, is really small. If that's the case, I can ignore natural convection, and the primary mode of heat transfer is by forced convection. And so finally, if I take that ratio and I calculate it, and I get something that is on the order of 1, so what do I mean by on the order of one? Well, essentially anything, right? It's right somewhere in that range. Right, again, there's not some specific cutoff here. So if you had something that was 0.4, 0.3, so somewhere where it looks like maybe natural convection should be ignored, but maybe it shouldn't, just go ahead and include it, right? If you're right there on the boundary, then it's really hard to make a decision. But if it's something that's pretty obvious, you calculate that number and you get a number two, well, then if you get two, you need to worry about both combined forced and natural convection. If you get a number 100, well, that's pretty obvious. I can ignore forced convection. And if I get some number that's 0 0.05, well, then I can ignore natural convection and I only need to consider forced convection. So hopefully those criteria will help provide you with some sense of when to use or consider forced convection, natural convection, and when you need to consider both forced and natural convection. Okay, so instead of immediately jumping into an example problem, I'm going to go ahead and end the video there. I will, in a separate video, work out an example problem uh, to help illustrate the use of natural, or, or to help illustrate heat transfer by natural convection, but I don't want to pile that on to the end of this video. So you can end this video, and then when I upload the video with the example problem, then take a break, do something else, come back and watch that example video. So uh, yeah, so I'll post this immediately, and then either later today or some point tomorrow, I will post a video going through an example problem involving natural convection.